My name is Sue Natale. I'm a scientist at the Woodwell Climate Research Center, and I'm also the lead on the Permafrost Pathways Initiative. The work that I do and that my team does focuses on the local to global impacts of climate change with a focus of, on permafrost thaw in the Arctic. So what's happening on the ground and then how do these changes that are happening on the ground impact everyone on the planet? I think the thing that excites me most about the work that I'm doing now is the opportunities that I have to work with scientists who are using really state-of-the-art techniques and remote sensing and field monitoring and modeling and especially at this point in time when there has just been so many advances made we can just do so much more now than we could have 10 years ago but in addition to working with the scientists on my team we also um, have an opportunity to work with communication specialists and policy experts and social justice experts and indigenous knowledge holders and so I think what's most exciting is figuring out a common language and to move us forward when we're thinking about how do we use the science that we're doing to help inform decision making, to help inform uh, solutions in the context of climate change. So Permafrost Pathways is a relatively new large-scale initiative that brings together Western scientists, indigenous knowledge holders, policy experts, social justice experts to address the impacts of permafrost thaw and other climate change hazards that are happening in the north. Our team works across the Pan-Arctic region. We focus on the science of monitoring and detecting the changes that are happening, but the big part of this project is thinking about how do we use this science to inform decision making related to global climate change mitigation, related to adaptation decision making that communities across the Arctic are, are having to make on the ground. And so some of the work that we're doing, a large component of this, we have partners in 10 Alaska Native communities who are making decisions about climate change adaptation. Um, that ranges anywhere from decisions about how to protect communities that in times may involve decisions to relocate, which is a really um, difficult decision to make. As the sort of scientist, technical expert, what my team does is we, we go in and we work with the communities, we hear what their needs are, and we hear what the observations are, and, and, and work together with them to figure out how do we combine their observations of changes that they've been seeing with the technical skills that my team has, and how do we use that to create better products, both to understand what's happened in the past, but also to think about decision making in the future. And that is something like models that are on spatial and temporal scales that are relevant and useful for communities that are making decisions. So on the scale of a home or, or other important infrastructure. Another important aspect of this work is thinking about the global implications of permafrost thaw. And a big issue here is permafrost thaws. It stores a lot of carbon. That carbon can be released into the atmosphere as greenhouse gases. That feedback on climate currently isn't fully incorporated into global decision making. When we're thinking about staying below 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius, and I guess I'd say like the math that we're doing to figure out how much carbon we have left is not fully incorporating permafrost carbon. So another big part of this project is doing the science, um, reducing uncertainty in our understanding of what's going to happen, but then also making sure that information is in the hands of decision makers so that we can hopefully keep some of the um, commitments that were made to in the Paris Agreement. A large part of the work that I do through Permafrost Pathways and other initiatives involves collaboration with scientists as well as with non-scientists. And what I've learned is that really involves taking the time to actively listen and engage with these communities through all phases of the project. So it's, it's, this is really critical because climate change is a multifaceted problem. And so as a scientist, I, I really can only touch on one aspect of that problem. And so it's critical for me to work with indigenous knowledge holders who have a more holistic understanding of both the problem and the solution. It's critical for me to work with policy experts and policymakers at the start of the project so that I can have a better understanding of how do we do our work in such a way that it's, it's useful and it's usable so that we don't get to the end of the project and share a product that, that just isn't, isn't relating to what people's needs are. And so it seems kind of simple, but it really, a lot of what I do is allocating 
time to sit and listen. And through that time listening, I think my understanding of the whole system problems and working towards a solution has really deepened. These collaborations are critical in helping to guide the way we do the science, the way the science is used, and hopefully how decisions are made. And so I, I guess I can give an example for adaptation decision making. I am a Western trained scientist. I didn't even grow up in the North. And so it is impossible for me to understand what the best decisions are for communities that are living in the Arctic. These communities have this knowledge. They've been dealing with this for decades. And so they need to be at the forefront of this decision making. And so, you know, it would be a failure if I went in without my tribal partners leading the way, guiding the work that needs to be done, guiding the way that the work needs to be done, and then helping us to, I'd say, help, you know, state, federal, government agencies to figure out how what we need to do and how we need to adapt to climate change because this is new for everyone and we're all trying to figure it out. So I look to these partners as leaders and as guides in moving um, towards a more sustainable and just pathway forward. It's challenging as a scientist to take this very detailed technical work and communicate this in a sentence or two. When I'm communicating to the public, I want to be respectful of the public and not simplify it too much, but you have to allow yourself to let some of the detail go. And I, I will say, I think my first lesson in communicating science to the general public was from a seventh grade science teacher, John Wood, um, who I met through the Polar Trek program. And he was in the field with me in Alaska. We would meet at night and he would ask me questions and then I would give an answer and I would go on and on and on and on and on with all the caveats that we do as scientists. And he was like, why can't you just stop with that first sentence? Like, why can't you just answer this? And so, you know, I spent a lot of time in the field with him really working on this and really realizing um, if you want people to understand what you're saying, you have to let some of it go. And so it, it definitely takes a lot of practice and it's definitely challenging. But it is important to me because for me as a scientist, I mean, partly I'm government funding. I feel like it's my obligation, my duty to share the work that I do with the public. But it's also I have this knowledge and being in a space where I can bridge that technical knowledge with what I think the public policymakers, communities need to know. Um, it's, it's a priority for me. So it's something that I work on and it's not something that um, comes naturally to me. But I think with anything, a scientist, if you prioritize something, you spend the time working on it and then you can get to the place where you need to be.